some swell ideas But every one of them ends in tears Please, Mr. Edison, tell me what's your medicine for me Give me another electric light and you'll see Mr. Thomas E. Could it be true that I'm as bright as you? tend to think of Edison as old hat uh, existing there in the 19th century. There's something to be said for that. Uh, certainly his time was different. Uh, the politics, the economics, the social environment, these were all uh, significantly different from what we have today. But invention is invention. And what goes on up here is, I think, uh, the same. Uh, what makes for creativity, innovation, invention uh, in the mind is the same. Uh, and although the environment is different, there are also some parallels there and some similarities uh, to the extent that I think we can indeed look at Edison and learn something about the role of innovation uh, in society today. I think if you took a poll of modern inventors, you'd find that Edison is one of the people that comes readily to their minds. He is a model or a mentor for them. And I think there are several reasons for that. One is that Edison invented things that changed everybody's life. Second reason is that he thought about the entire invention process, from the idea to the problem solving to the marketing and making of his invention. And that's something that modern inventors also have to think about. There's no doubt that Edison continues to fascinate. Historians study him as much as ever as one of the creators of the modern world. But do studies of his working methods reveal anything about invention and innovation today? Or is he, for the rest of us, no more than a figure from history, a relic of an already distant age? Is Edison still relevant to our lives? Do we really need to know that much about him to spend all this time and money and energy on him? And yet it turns out, as you begin to investigate this fellow, that he really understood that Invention and innovation was a process that was very complicated and, and difficult, but one that involved a whole range of different skills and uh, All of which he managed to... He managed to embody. And it, it's studying him, I think, that allows us to see this whole process. And it was from the, from the genesis of the idea, through its development, into something that actually worked making that into something you could manufacture and sell at a reasonable price and that people wanted and that worked out in the marketplace, um, that, that was the system that emerged around the late 19th century, and that's the system we still have today. Yeah. Edison's great invention was the system of invention. While over a thousand inventions brought him international fame, it is Edison's system of invention that makes him so important today. And only now is his vast archive of papers being fully explored. The papers at the Edison National Historic Site in West Orange, New Jersey, are revealing new details of Edison's working methods. Known as the Edison Papers Project, the study is being coordinated at Rutgers University, 50 miles outside New York. He left notebooks, he left ledgers, he left incoming and outgoing correspondence and blueprints. And um, we expect it's going to take us till 2015 to finish this project. Of course, up. the reason that it's taking us till 2015 is because when the project first started, uh, it was slated to be about 20 years. And uh, at that point, there were about one and a half million pages that was estimated in the total collection. And nobody had ever done an inventory of the archive. And as we began to investigate, uh, more and more paper turned up. And it's now about five or five and a half million pages. There are notebooks. 
letter books, incoming correspondence, their corporate records, uh, you name it, uh, we have it. Edison's notebooks reveal almost everything about him. Um, everything perhaps except that exact moment when he really gets an idea. But he wrote things down quickly, uh, and he wrote down one idea right after another. Uh, watching him invent is kind of like watching Robin Williams on the stage. Just ideas just pour out of him. And other inventors had ideas. They just didn't have them as fast. And there's this story uh, when one, he and one of his associates are sitting around with some reporters, and, and Edison is being quite modest and saying, well, anybody could have thought that up. And, and his associate says, well, I didn't think it up. You know, and I, I was, was there. Looking, yeah, I was the doing it, looking at the same things you were. It's because you were Edison. And I think that was the key, is that uh, uh, he was a creative genius. And there's no getting around that. Although Edison was unique, in many ways he typifies modern invention and innovation in the way he came up with ideas and turned them into successful products. His laboratory notebooks track the way his thoughts emerged, altered, and developed. His business papers show how he dealt with financiers, suppliers, and customers. Behind the products, Edison experts have assembled a detailed picture of the process of invention and innovation, as carried out by one of the most successful inventive minds of all time. Edison wasn't interested in scientific advances or discoveries per se. He wanted to make things that people would use in their homes or their workplaces. So he was very concerned from the outset to create inventions that solved people's real problems and that he could mass produce. He understood the difference between a single breakthrough development and a mass produced artifact that would be used and paid for time and again. A scientific man busies himself with theory. He is absolutely impractical. An inventor is essentially practical. Anything that won't sell, I don't want to invent. But sale is proof of utility. And utility is success. collecting Edison's artifacts and inventions, I feel a little closer to the man by some of his personal effects that I have. I was given one of Edison's canes, which Edison had walked with. This particular cane is made out of uh, natural wood, and at one time Edison must have walked with it. It just gives me a little bit of a thrill to know that Edison once had this in his hand. Along with the cane, I got many of his medals and badges that he once wore when he visited uh, many conventions and stuff like that, and even one of his early cigars. Even though he didn't like people smoking cigarettes, he did have his cigars. Inside this drawer, I have a book of early Medlow Park days, which is dated 1878. It shows you the work that he was doing in them years and how he worked with other people and his projects. Some of the projects in the books are the early electric pen, carbon microphone. He worked on just about anything. One experiment led into the other. It leaves a paper trail of what he was doing and thinking in the early days. Already a successful inventor in the world of telegraphy, in 1876, at the age of 29, Edison created the Menlo Park Laboratory. He had a vision of an environment in which all the know-how he needed could be immediately available. Edison knew that to achieve the technological breakthroughs he sought, he would need to draw on other people's scientific knowledge and experience. And at Menlo Park, he assembled a team of scientists and engineers who would be permanently at his call. Within a year, he would be internationally famous through his invention of the phonograph. 
Within two years after success with incandescent lighting, he would be the most celebrated inventor in the world. One thing that set Edison apart from his contemporaries was his ability to orchestrate the entire invention process. He understood that he had to define the problems or the opportunities for the team that worked with him. But he brought together not only that team of skilled individuals, but the financing, the raw materials, and the equipment with which they could work to solve the problem. And the layout of the Menlo Park Laboratory expressed his own vision of the invention process. The open second floor of the laboratory, which allowed a free flow of information, and then the individual craft shops where skills could be practiced on their own, and then the white picket fence encompassing the entire campus, which both kept in the workers and kept out interlopers. And Edison can be undisturbed by all of the visitors or the journalists or the financiers who have come to, to see the wizard at work. Fifty years later, Edison's first laboratory was a forgotten shell. Its creator, an old man, whose methods of innovation had become common practice. The heyday of Menlo Park and Edison's early team had passed, but its importance remained and was recognized by Henry Ford, the figurehead of a new generation. He transported the first invention factory to Detroit and restored it to its former glory as part of a huge museum site. Today, it stands as an icon of industrial development. For the first time, Edison has everything that he needs. He's got the machinists in the shop. He has these uh, experimental assistants who know what he wants and are able to do what he wants. So he now had something new, an invention factory, the first R&D research laboratory, if you will. One of the key elements of Edison's creativity was that he understood the value of failure. He consistently talked about how he, there, he'd never failed. He, there were experiments that failed, but he and there were, ideas, there were ideas that didn't work out. But all, he, all that meant was that it was something that he learned from. He saw failure as a way of learning, and I think that's something that's, that we've almost forgotten in this day and age, that failure is an important way of learning about something. Right, and in fact, he had such a good supply of chemicals that the first night that the fire went out in the laboratory and all the chemicals froze, what we see the next day in his notebook is a record of his noting what happened to every one of those chemicals. So, so somebody else might have seen that as, right. as a disaster, but Edison saw it as an opportunity. A real virtue out of necessity. Let me say a word about certain characteristics of invention. One is that the inventor should have self-confidence that Edison certainly had. And the second is a dogged determination sense that you know where you're going and that that's going to get you where you want to go. And Edison certainly had that. There's a third element, enjoying what you're doing that is a part of invention. Uh, for Edison, this was in large part being with the fellows, doing practical jokes uh, and that sort of thing. And this is exactly what's happening here in Menlo Park. Just the exhilaration he gets out of rolling up his sleeves, getting his hands dirty, working directly uh, with the other people in the laboratory. Edison's team allowed him to work far more quickly than his contemporaries. Only hours after having an inventive idea, models would have been made, experiments carried out, and the process of refinement would already have begun. It meant, among other things, that you could fail more often. You could afford to go off and do numerous things in one direction, and so uh, you know, 50 of them didn't work. It didn't make any difference. You could keep going until you found something that would work. Uh, the late night sessions, uh, uh, breaking at midnight and bringing in coffee and, uh, and pie and all that sort of thing. Uh, this was what he enjoyed. This was, to him, what invention was all about. And that's why it's not surprising that when he makes money on his inventions, which he does, uh, so, I mean, some of that goes to creature comforts, but basically where that money goes is right back into the laboratory uh, because that's where his life is.
awakened at 5.15 a.m. My eyes were embarrassed by the sunbeams, turned my back to them, and tried to take another dip into oblivion. Awakened at 8.15, powerful itching of my head, lots of white, dry dandruff. <sighs> Oh, it's nomadic. All over my coat. Must read about it in an encyclopedia. Ugh, smoking too much makes me nervous. Must lasso my natural tendencies to acquire such habits. Holding heavy cigar constantly in my mouth is deformed my upper lip. Sort of has a Havana curl. Arouse at nine o'clock. Came downstairs expecting to hear twas too late for breakfast. Twasn't. Ugh, I couldn't eat much. Nerves of stomach too nicotiny. Roots of tobacco plants must go clear through to hell. In 1877, Thomas Edison was very well known in a small circle of financiers and telegraph inventors and users of the telegraph. And then he, in an effort to devise a machine that would take down a telephone message so that it could be copied out at a reasonable pace, he suddenly found he had invented a way to record sound. Um, he actually devised a telegraph device and several hours later realized to his great surprise what he had done, that he had solved a tremendously difficult problem. Right, and the next day he writes down, I can record sound and play it back anytime I want. Well, this was an astounding thing in the 19th century. This was a problem that was being investigated by leading scientists, and they saw speech as something very complex. And here's this joker. He takes a piece of tin foil and a needle and a diaphragm, and he records and plays back sound. And, and people thought that this couldn't be, uh, that it was some kind of fraud. I designed my original tin foil phonograph in cylinder form and gave it to my faithful John Crusey to make. He made fun of it. I was almost as surprised as he was when the first model reproduced Murray Howe, the little lad, which had shouted into it. Edison invented the phonograph in 1877. This particular model is from 1878. It's a demonstration model. Edison demonstrated in Menlo Park. And by shouting into the mouthpiece and recording on the tinfoil, he recorded the human voice. Testing, one, two, three, four. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Never before has a human voice been recorded and then played back. That was the first word spoken by Mr. Edison on the talking machine. We'll turn it back to the beginning. That's simply amazing. I don't think it's any accident that when Edison invented the phonograph, it catapulted him into international fame because it moved him from being an obscure inventor of arcane devices to make telegraphy cheaper and better into being an inventor that captured the national imagination. And I think that hold remains with us today because Edison really made it possible for us to preserve the past in a way that had never been able to be done before. Edison immediately began drawing up lists of ways to use this new technology that he had not anticipated and, and didn't have any plan for. And he thought about recording last will and testament, recording sermons, recording um, records, what we would call records Children's music. toys. I mean, right. he had a whole 
slew of different things that he envisioned as, Even as being talking commercially viable consulting. for. The problem was the technology took a long time to make it uh, commercially uh, successful. However, even without the commercial success, this made him Thomas Right, this made Edison. him the Wizard of Menlo Park. I mean, this, this was the invention that made Thomas Edison. It was so astounding to people. And literally, reporters, the common man, and financiers were beating a path <laughs> to Thomas finances. Edison's door at Menlo Park. There were trains coming out to see this wonderful new invention. Uh, there were people who uh, heard that Edison was thinking about working on the electric light. Uh, and so they sent their representatives out to talk to Edison and, and uh, uh, see if they could get in on the action. And in the fall of 1878, when he did start working on the electric light, seriously, he had money. He had lots of money. Huh. We've got a patent factory. Here, we can turn out inventions to order, a minor invention about every 10 days. And a big trick, every six months or so. Ha. Menlo Park brought together science and technology in a way that had never been done before. Edison knew that science held the key to achieving radical inventions, and by combining scientific research with the machine shop, he had created the first integrated research and development facility in the world. Menlo Park contradicts the perception of Edison as a 19th century tinkerer, an image which, for reasons known only to himself, Edison was happy to reinforce. When I start to experiment with anything, I do not read the book. I do not want to know what has been done. I try and experiment and reason out the result somehow by methods, well, which I could not explain. From the beginning of his career, Edison recognized that invention required more than just working with the technology itself, you needed some sort of basic understanding of the science behind it. And so from the very beginning, he studied electricity. As he got into chemistry later on, he studied chemistry, even hired somebody to help him uh, learn chemistry better. Uh, he read the basic textbooks. He had manuals around so he could pull them off the shelf and say, OK, what do we know about this particular problem? OK, and that was always a starting point. What do we know about the problem? But that was never a stopping point. It was always, what can we now learn to help us solve the problem? and he would research until he, in fact, found the solution. The perception of Edison and other 19th century inventors as talented tinkerers is really, it, it's demeaning, and it's a kind of platonic hangover that people who think are somehow doing more thinking than people who make things with their hands, who devise physical objects, who go on, who find ways to manufacture them and bring them to market and make them successful. That's yeah. something that Edison recognized. And it was not just hard thought to, to develop the idea and to work with other people in order to bring it into physical being, but then to actually turn it into something that people would want in the marketplace was something It's not a crucial. trivial part of invention. Innovation is as critical to bringing something to reality as sitting down and having that light bulb go off over your head. By announcing that he wanted to make his career as a professional inventor, Edison established the idea that technological change would not come about haphazardly in response to local situations, but rather it would be ongoing, that a group of individuals would be constantly making change and responsible for those changes. That's one of the reasons that the pace of change, particularly technological change, has sped up in the last century. You now have individuals who spend their full-time occupations as change makers. Edison also demonstrated to corporations that if they controlled technological development, they could dominate future markets. So by tying science, research, and technological development to corporations, Edison established much of the contours of the modern world. While teamwork was critical to his success, it was Edison himself who generated most of the original ideas. So where does the process of invention really begin? How does the inventive mind actually work? 
I think inventors all have one common thing. They're very keen observers of nature and the world around them, and they sometimes look at things in ways the rest of us don't. The greatest fundamental inventions are usually things that once they've been invented, everybody looks and says, heck, I could have thought of that. The fact of the matter is they didn't. Remember the person who invented Velcro, I guess it was a Swiss guy, was walking through a field and got some burrs stuck on his coat. Now, every one of us has had burrs stuck on our coat. The point of the matter is that he looked at it and said, hmm, maybe I can do something useful with this. It's a lot like Sherlock Holmes looking at a crime scene and drawing his own conclusions that are totally different. I mean, we all see the same picture. We all see the same things. They just come to different conclusions. It's not that they're smarter. They just know the difference between seeing and observing. They take the known and build it into something that's new and unknown. I could not help laughing at the ease with which he explained his process of deduction. When I hear you give your reasons, I remarked, the thing always appears to me so ridiculously simple that I could easily do it myself. Though, at each successive instance of your reasoning, I am baffled until you explain your process. And yet, I believe my eyes are as good as yours. Quite so, he answered, lighting a cigarette and throwing himself down into an armchair. You see, but you do not observe. The distinction is clear. For example, you have frequently seen the steps which lead from the hallway up to this room. Frequently. How often? Well, some hundreds of times. Then how many are there? I, mean, I, I don't know. Right. You have seen, yet you have not observed. That's just my point. Now, I know that there are 17 steps because I have both seen and observed. It's important to recognize that the inventive process is not simply having a good idea. The good idea has to be reduced to some sort of practice that is useful, that is easy to make, that is saleable. All of these things enter into it. But the process is one that does involve, number one, thinking about it in a visual way, number two, probably sketching it out in some way to help you with the visual process, and finally, working with others to realize a three-dimensional model of it to make it happen. The idea becomes a working reality. But before making an invention public, a crucial step remains. All inventors must think about protecting their ideas, and the patent system comes into play. Edison clearly understood the patent system not simply as a way to credit himself for his inventions, but also to stake out ground and to basically keep of competitors out of the same field that he was in. He also, interestingly, not only patented the end products, he would patent parts of the process of making those end products. Again, understanding the relationship between invention and manufacturability. Edison would tie those two together and try to control them through the patent process. In a lot of cases, he was spurred by the needs of a customer, for example, Western Union Company, who needed ways to save money on telegraph wire, and this would lead him to develop a product like the duplex telegraph that could send two messages over the same wire at the same time. But there were other situations, and most notable of those being something like the phonograph, where Edison's own curiosity takes him off in a new direction and he discovers something entirely different. So economic need of a customer can be one driving reason to develop an invention, or simple personal curiosity can be another, and both are very, very important in the case of, of any inventor, I would argue. Edison was extraordinarily good at inventing for the market, of seeing some sort of need out there and then addressing that uh, in his laboratory. But just because you come up with an invention that you see is needed doesn't mean that the world is going to come beating a path to your door and ask for it or demand it. Uh, Edison understood this. Uh, and he was also very good, as it turns out, of dealing with reporters, of uh, bringing them out to Menlo Park, of uh, entertaining them, and of turning them loose to write uh, extraordinarily uh, uh, favorable copy uh, about his work.
I think one of the things that set Edison apart from his contemporaries was his understanding of system in two senses. First, he saw inventing as a systemic process, from understanding the problem to researching a variety of solutions to developing your particular solution to making sure that that could be replicated and then marketing it, making sure that the people who wanted it got your solution to their problems. In the second sense, he understood the crea his own creations as systems. It wasn't just the light bulb. It was the entire lighting system. He made an analogy to the gas system and saw that you had to develop all parts of the system so that he understood the invention as a system as well. The team, the talent, and the money. He had it all. In 1878, Edison sought and received sponsorship from financiers for a new venture. The drive for results forced his team to be more systematic than ever in their search for the most famous invention of all, the electric light. The problem of electric lighting in the 1870s was occupying a number of inventors. It was seen as a very important problem. It was seen as a tremendously fertile field for invention. Well, what ultimately sets Edison apart from everybody else who's working on the light is that even though he starts at the same place, the light bulb, he soon realizes that it's a bigger problem and he's the only one that has the resources to solve that problem, to take a part of the system and work on it, take another part and work on it simultaneously and expand out until he's working on all parts of the system simultaneously and sees the interaction of the dynamo and the, uh, the light and the distribution system and the meter and everything else and he can set his team to work working on various parts of it until he's surrounded the problem. He's the one who now can look at the whole thing and not just see it as an electric light but see it as an electric distribution system. Light allowed humans to conquer the darkness and the night in a way that every individual could could do simply by flipping the switch or initially by turning the knob. And I think that that has continued on and made people think so dramatically about how technology and human inventiveness can change not just their lives but nature and the world itself so that it becomes a very elemental, um, even mythic, uh, success story of inventors and invention. You know, today the light bulb has come to symbolize the eureka moment in invention. Like, oh, he had a bright idea. We have even see cartoons where people, the little light bulb goes on and click. But you know, the light bulb invention itself, ironically, took a lot of hard work. And as near as I've been able to determine, there was no eureka moment in the invention of light bulb. It was just a lot of plain hard work. Genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. Why, it's been just so in all of my inventions. The first step is intuition and comes with a burst. And then difficulties arise. This thing goes out, and then that. And then months of intense watching, study, and labor are required before commercial success is certainly achieved. The phonograph had come as a surprise to the world, but now Edison was in competition with other inventors across the United States, in France, and in Britain. Electric light became inevitable as the jigsaw of enabling technology fell into place. One of the last pieces was a pump that could deliver an effective vacuum. The Sprengel Mercury Pump, improved and refined by his team, was critical to Edison's success. Fifty years later, at a newly reconstructed laboratory, 
Edison recreated the light bulb experiment with the same pump in the presence of President Hoover, Henry Ford, and an old assistant, Francis Yale. Ford declared that the chair Edison had used should never be moved again, and from that day, it was fixed permanently to the floor in memory of the inventor's triumph over nature. We're striking it big, an electric light. Even better than my vivid imagination first conceived. Where this thing is going to stop, Lord only knows. To people around about 1880, electric light must have seemed almost magical. I mean, the very idea that when you go into a room, you could just press a knob or turn a knob and get light, just like that. You didn't have to mess around with dirty matches, sticky oil and candles. These two bulbs were made by different people, Edison and Swan, and there were several other makers as well making very similar lamps. Edison and Swan approached the business side of the business very differently. Swan in this country concentrated on making the light bulb itself. Edison's idea of electric lighting was that you should have the Edison lamp put in an Edison lamp holder taken by Edison wires back to the Edison power station and he believed in building the whole system from the power station to the lamp himself. It was a different approach. I suppose the um, American entrepreneur and the English country chemist had very different approaches to life. But um, there was that quite remarkable difference between the two men. Edison invented a light bulb in 1879. I have some very early experimental light bulbs that were done in his Medlow Park days with William Hammer. William Hammer worked for Edison, and every once in a while he would experiment with the light bulbs, and Mr. Hammer would take it and put it aside. Uh, these are the original cards that were put on by William Hammer, and there's one in here in particular I like. This one's dated American, 1881 Edison. Used to light up at the first central station for incandescent lamp electric lighting in the world, Holborn Viaduct. 3,000 lamps were used in London, England. In here I have the, the bulb that came from that. I've been very fortunate to find this group of bulbs that was from the William Hammer collection, and it's exciting to know I have a piece of history in my hand. With electric light, it was his commercial success that set Edison apart from competing inventors. While many of his ideas were not unique, he was particularly successful at developing and then selling them. The lighting system at Hoban Viaduct in London became the first public, full-scale, electrical distribution system in the world. The Hoban Viaduct area was a very good site to try a bit of public electricity supply. There was no legislation then about digging up the streets for electric cables, but with the viaduct, which is a nice open iron structure, they could thread wires along and through the viaduct to quite a large number of premises without having to worry about digging anything up, whether that was legal or not. So they could take their wires round and connect up quite a number of customers. When Edison decided to invent a, an electric lamp, it was in the context of an existing system uh, that he wanted to replace, and that existing system was gas lighting, something people were used to. Uh, and if you're going to replace it, it had to be sufficiently similar to what's there uh, so that people are not turned off by it. If you have something that's more expensive, uh, if you have something that's uh, not as bright, uh, and so forth, you simply aren't going to sell it. People won't accept it. Uh, and we find the same thing happening today with something, let's say, like a compact fluorescent lamp. Uh, it has to replace something that exists. Therefore, it has to screw into the same socket. Uh, it has to be at least as bright, and comparably bright to the existing thing. It has to uh, uh, have the same color spectrum, or very close to it. Uh, it has to turn on and turn off. Uh, all these things that, uh, that Edison was facing as well. The same wire that brings the light 
will also bring power and heat. With the power, you can run an elevator, or a sewing machine, or any other mechanical contrivance. And by means of heat, you can cook your food. We have an exhibit in this building uh, called Lighting and Revolution. It's about Edison. And it's about the light bulb and how this invention, this single invention, and some other things that followed triggered after maybe 20 years uh, a whole new development uh, in this country, a commitment to electricity as the energy source, as the energy distribution system. And having electricity widespread in the home, these wires coming out that were paid for by, in effect, by the desire to have lighting, then made it possible to attach other devices, toasters, waffle irons, uh, electric toothbrushes. And people who were inventing these things didn't have to pay for that infrastructure. They could use their imagination and go off running uh, in these other directions uh, and attach uh, to the system. Uh, this sort of thing happens again and again. Uh, simple example today. Uh, we've had telephones for many years and little wire pairs coming in that carry the telephone uh, conversation. Well, this is now being replaced by fiber optics. And these fibers are going to be coming into the home. And what's paying for this? Well, uh, more or less the fact that people want, for some reason, 800 television channels. But there are other things out there that haven't been invented yet, things that people are thinking about that will emerge because this system exists. At the heart of it, there's intuition here. In the same way that we bet our company on Windows, uh, we're betting our future on our vision of the information highway and spending over $100 million a year and putting all of our reputation on the line that there will be a lot of highway activity that's important and that our software will be a, a major part of that. Many people have compared Bill Gates to Thomas Edison. I think there are reasons for that comparison. First of all, they both operate in the high-tech, leading-edge technology of their age. Secondly, they both have tremendous ambitions to change the way people live their lives. And thirdly, they both set up processes of invention that involve a tightly knit, highly cohesive team of individuals who are absolutely driven and led by a single visionary. In the 1880s, it's Edison. In the 1980s and 90s, it's Gates. They both have their campuses. They both have their highly publicized products. They both know how to use publicity to their ends. And they both are intent on not simply creating new technologies, but in having those technologies alter the lives of everyone on Earth. Well, Windows, in a certain sense, is a kind of standard. It it runs on about 90% of all the, the computers that get sold. If you take Windows and Macintosh, those are the two that have enough applications that they're, they're mainstream in environments. And the, the vast majority of the volume, 90%, uh, is actually on the Windows side. We should realize at the same time that the commitment to a single system has a downside. Uh, if you have only electricity in the home, then you can't have a gas stove or a gas refrigerator, uh, which might be cheaper or more desirable for various other reasons. And if indeed uh, everybody has electricity, then not only is it limiting the consumer, but it's also limiting the inventor. Why should you invent a gas, whatever it is, uh, because nobody can use it out there? Uh, and this sort of limitation uh, happens uh, again and again when we make a commitment to a particular standard or a particular type uh, of system. Uh, so that today, if, uh, uh, if we end up committing ourselves completely to a Windows operating system, for instance, uh, or a DOS for that matter, uh, you then have made it difficult, if not impossible, uh, for the person who wants to develop a program around another system or for the consumer who would rather use another system uh, is not available. When Edison died, 
the research directors of the day looked back on his life, and they saw him as the last of the great lone inventors. Uh, what they didn't recognize is that, in fact, he was the first of them. He was the first one to develop this re idea of the research laboratory and to assemble a team and to work on a whole system of invention and innovation uh, in order to introduce new products into the marketplace. You know, today's world seems so different than the world of Thomas Edison. We have computers, we have government regulations, we have pollution concerns. There are all these different things that are different now than they were back then. But you know, the basic inventive process is just about the same now as it was then. Inventors still have to visualize things, they still have to observe, they still have to mull things over in their minds, they still make sketches one way or another, and they still make models, and the inventive process remains essentially unchanged. I think the lessons that Edison has to offer the modern world, in many cases, are lessons that, that we ought to reject, such as simply uh, adopting technological change for its own sake, or adopting technological opportunities because they serve some corporate interests. Um, he was relatively uninterested in, in science, and I think that science clearly has, has, a, has a place in its own right for discovery, for understanding, as opposed for economic gain. Um, but the real role of Edison in the modern world is to sensitize us, I think, to the role that technology and creativity can play in our lives, not only as consumers, but as potential developers. Um, even it's as simple as using something in a new way that we have in our own homes. So that Edison is the example of somebody who simply wants to make their life better using material things. And that's a lesson that we can all learn from. Thank you.